So one thing you have to ask yourself if you're in the asphalt, asphalt mixture area or pavements and materials area, sort of where, where do I fit? And uh, our graduate students at A&M, I usually give, the, I give a lecture as part of a seminar series there. So I, I am so focused, particularly as a graduate student, on asphalt and asphalt mixtures, the rest of the world sort of goes away. And so where, where do we fit in this, this whole big scheme of things? We're, we're a small part of it. In fact, almost any of you that are in your graduate educations now are really a small part of the all technology that is necessary to provide society with the things that it needs to be provided with. And so how do I fit in there? And you need to constantly examine that. You need the big picture as well as being very good and focused at what you're going to do technically. So don't think of the big picture as somebody else is going to take care of that because they're not. you got to think about where you fit in there. So think about some of the things I'm going to say from that regard because uh, that's going to be important to you as well. So where does the money come from to build pavements and build them out of asphalt, things of that nature? Where does that money come from? It comes from primarily the, the public sector, doesn't it? State departments of transportation, Federal Highway Administration has a role in that, but they just take our money back to Washington and then send it back to us, or at least part of it. Cities and counties. So it's largely a public works funding thing. There are some private dollars as well. Private dollars for parking lots, for example, and shopping centers is the most notable one of those things. Some of the toll authorities are semi-private, so there's some private dollars involved in those. There's concessions or uh, projects that uh, essentially uh, some countries in the world, and there's a little bit of this going on in the United States, where build a road from here to here, and that's your road for the next 50 years. And you can charge tolls on it, however you want to get your revenue back, but it's yours to provide that transportation facility. You see that more in Europe than you see it here and some other countries in the world. Uh, but if we're going to answer our need to have mobility in this country, particularly with highways, we're probably going to see more of that. A lot of political resistance to it at times, but we're going to see more private ownership. When you have private sector money involved in things, you see more innovation because there's more of an economic incentive in order to deliver something at a lower cost that's going to be safe and that's going to be long lasting. There's more of an incentive there than there is in general, in my opinion, in the public sector funding as well. So we want to build things that are safe. We want to build things that that last a long time, that are low cost. And what I'm going to talk about today, before we get to the research part of this thing a little bit, is we want to be able to do that quickly, fast. We want to accelerate construction. And it's extremely important that we keep this in mind. And I want to give you a little bit of a history of that and point out to you why I think this may be the thing that's going to help us uh, move forward in our asphalt and asphalt mixture field as well. So what's the definition of construction? When I, when I talk about accelerated construction, I'm using construction to mean the green fields and the new, new places you're going to build a pavement from A to B across some kind of a new environment. I'm talking about various kinds of projects for capacity improvement, adding a third lane to, to a, a two-lane freeway going in one direction, various reconstruction kinds of operations, various rehabilitation op operations, major and minor, major, anytime you're out there in front of the public. Get out there, get it done, get out of there. And as driving public, you really want that, don't you? How many times have you been upset? Oh my gosh, I've been out there for a month trying to fill a pothole. And we see it all the time. And if we're very sensitive to it and we're familiar with the technology of this stuff, what do you think the driving public is? That's really something that, that gears them up in a hurry. So it's very important in order that we do those kinds of things. Some of the concepts, just very quickly here for a Hot mix overlay on a pavement. Pretty straightforward project. We're going to go overlay uh, Interstate 65 out here. They've scheduled to do it in 30 days. Is there any reason you can't do it in six days? There's really not. You can do it if you, if you want to get geared up to do that. Rehabilitation, reduced from nine months to four weekends. That's been done as well. Take Adding lanes from 18 months to nine months in a short section. That's been done. Reconstruction, reduced from three and a half years maybe down to a year or a year and a half, something of that nature. All these things have been done and are possible 
And if you look at yourself from a driving public, it's very important. Just think of what, what the public sees. We do all kinds of planning. We do all kinds of design. We do all kinds of plans and spec development and engineering behind that. And then we go out there and build it. And the only time the public sees it, most of the public sees it, is when it's under construction. That's our connection with the public. So we should focus on that. We should focus on that time that we're with the driving public out there. It will help us with safety. We'll be out there in a very short period of time. If we do things right, it'll be a safer environment for the driving public. And in some cases, it's lower cost. In other cases, it costs more to do the construction, but it saves user and non-user costs. And I want to bring that in before we're through today. We're not talking about reducing construction time 5%, 10%, 20%. We're talking about reducing the 50%. Some people have reached down here into the 70 and 80 percent. Huge changes, but it's a change in thinking. It's a change in design. It's a change in materials that we have to go through, and we can fit into that very, very nicely. Recurring peak period congestion. You see it in the red up there, highly congested areas from 2011. This is what it's forecasted to be 2040. Look what happened. You think if we don't build anything, people won't come? California philosophy, Governor Brown, sees this, this is the second time he's been governor out there. In the 60s and 70s, Governor Brown said, we're not going to build any freeways. We're going to sell all of our right away for our future freeways, which they did. Got more money in the state coffers. And he said, people won't come. And he was right. It only changed from 15 million to 32 million <laughs> in that period. So it was dead right, but nobody ever thought about that again. That is not going to happen. This is what's going to happen in California. Look at your areas up in here. Look what happens to Texas down here where I'm from. We're going to have congestion. We're going to have more people using our roadway. Vehicle miles have gone up 80% during the period you see up there. Drivers have gone up about 30%. Lane miles have gone up a whopping almost 4%. And this really conveys the story to you right away. So we are going to have congestion on our highways. It's going to get greater unless we add capacity to it. If we add capacity under high intensity traffic, we're going to have a lot of problems. So we've got to figure out how to get this done. It's just an overwhelming thing in the public's eye. So like most things, uh, it's not new. Concepts have been around for a while. We had a meeting out in... Uh, in Nevada, in our uh, facility out there, the feds were in there, pretty high, well, very high level Federal Highway Administration, some state DOT people through AASHTO. And we were talking about a variety of things and sort of came up with something to say, we need to get in there, we need to stay in there. This is in the workplace on a construction zone. And then we need to get it out of there as soon as we can and stay out of there as long as we can. So this is, this is the accelerated construction part of it, get in, stay in, get in there and get it done. The last part of it is get out of there, obviously, stay out of there, long life, high quality, safe environments, all those things are in that catchy thing. California twisted it around a little bit, TRB task force was formed in 99. There were some workshops we had on this topic a little bit during this period of time, and then they launched a little bit of a program in, in about... Uh, 2003 there in that area. Examples of projects. Just hit a couple of highlights here. This was in Louisiana. It was a hurricane evacuation route. Extremely important to that part of the country. Um, they were they were rehabilitating the pavement and they were going to go in and take the old concrete pavement out, put a new concrete pavement in. Instead, they rubbleized the existing concrete pavement, overlaid it with some thick asphalt pavement, and did that in a very short period of time. Uh, complete in seven months as opposed to a two to three year project they had planned. That's a design change and it's a material change and a lot of construction sequencing as well. Another project in Oregon, uh, pretty high traffic as you can see up there, uh, put 40,000 tons of hot mix down there. They've scheduled to do it in 32 nights with closures. Uh, they reduced the duration of the project by 85%, saved about 2% because they did it faster. And we're able to figure out things on how to get that done. It was a safe environment and pointed out to be that as well. In Wilmington, Delaware, they had a, a route on I-95 that they could divert traffic for quite a few 
quite a few miles around it, so they closed it down. And this is the secret to some of this stuff. They had a bonus of $25,000 a day, which got the contractor's opinion uh, involved in this and attention very quickly. 75% reduction in duration, closed it down, created the workspace, got the thing done, got the public back onto it again. So really a nice kind of a project here. Several of those kind of projects have been done in Washington as, as well. Uh, Maine, essentially, they just speeded up the work a tremendous amount. Uh, and they actually had five different paving crews out there at one particular time. They, rather than doing it three summers, they got it done particularly quickly in one summer here. A lot of, lot, not a lot of projects, three or four major projects in California. Uh, used various kinds of materials, some rapid setting cements, concrete in this particular case to speed the whole project up. Uh, had some incentives in here and reduced the work from 8.5 months to, to six weeks. Big, big, big savings. So these are possible. Okay, we have to stop at this point and say, wow, that sounds good, let's go out and do every project. It's not for every project. There's probably two major categories of projects. Some of these are the ones I just gave you. Highly congested areas, got to get traffic back on. There's things we can do to create a work zone to get this thing. The other kinds of projects are just really politically sensitive. There may be some small town out in rural Indiana that you have to go ahead and do something through the center of that town. If you can go in there and get it done in a couple weekends versus the whole summer or a summer and a half, you become a hero. And it may not make economic sense from a user, non-user cost point of view, but it makes a lot of political sense to do that. It gets a lot of goodwill from that politician in that area that's going to go to the state house is going to vote on how much money to give the state DOT. So there's a couple categories of project, but not for everyone. Emergency versus planned. This is the ones we'll talk about a little bit more today. The emergency projects, a um, couple good examples, earthquake in Southern California, Knocked a lot of bridges down in the LA basin out towards Santa Monica. I don't know how many bridges there were. They redid the thing in 16 months. Built, I don't know how many bridges, a whole bunch of bridges and freeway. Northern California, another earthquake. Knocked down a freeway, killed a number of people, unfortunately. Took nine years to get it done. Part of that was being held up by, we can't put it there, we gotta put it over here. You can't do this, the citizen's not happy, etc. Entirely different philosophies on how to get things done. So. Planning is a big, big part of this, and this involves planning and programming, preliminary design, all the environmental stuff, right-of-way utilities, and every time you talk to a contractor, they mention right-of-way, utilities are the two big things, and the third one are railroads. They have more delays associated with those three things than anything else. And then you've got to prepare the plan specs and, and engineering kinds of things and let it and get it under construction. That's the whole process that you have to go through. To have good big projects, that's what has to happen. Again, it's highly visible to the public, it will improve safety, and it makes economic sense in many cases. So what are some of the economic considerations? We can slice these things a couple of ways. One is the agency, the expenses that you see up there. So it's gonna cost the agency to do accelerated construction more in some cases, a little bit less in others, depending on the nature of the project, but typically it'll be more, and I'll show a key example of this before we're through. There is a cost to the public as well, and adjacent businesses, as we'll see, in terms of time that you're delayed, the fuel, the wear and tear on your vehicle, that's substantial, by the way. And the contractor uh, looks at labor, materials, insurance and bonding capacities. All There's a lot of things involved in here, too, that we cannot forget, so it's gonna take it's gonna take a village to get this done. Another way to cut this are direct agency costs and indirect. And sort of the indirect are the, are the, the public expenses, and the vehicle expenses, and the adjacent businesses. The, the business is affected by the what things we do on our roadways, that, that amount of money is substantial. We've done a little bit of work on that, and it really tips a project one way or the other. Here's the cost of delaying projects. It could be environmental, could be construction, or anything. These are just three examples that we pulled together and got some economic data together. One of these projects was about a half a million dollars a month because it, it was delayed. So you can, you can get a lot of money going in a hurry. These are only, only public costs associated with vehicle delays. It does not include adjacent businesses, which is huge in some cases. 
This is the Katy Freeway down in Houston. We just happened to have pretty good data. There was a corridor of about 21 miles long. Construction was reduced from 12 years to six years. And this is a highly, highly traveled facility. It's from Houston out to the west there through a lot of bedroom communities. You can see it on the, on the diagram here. Uh, $2.6 billion, about two thirds of that was in construction cost. The benefit cost ratio was nine to nothing. You spent a little bit more money to accelerate it, but you got nine times a return to the public associated with that. And these costs are not adjacent businesses, as I recall in this particular case. So when you get benefit cost ratios of that, it's pretty important. Now you're saying, well, the public agency doesn't pay for my cost if I'm delayed. If I get delayed in a project for a half an hour and I miss the soccer game or whatever, that's not a cost to the public agency. They, they shouldn't pay for that. Society pays for it. So if you look at it from a societal point of view, these are real dollars here. They're real dollars. Okay, more about safety and economics. You can go into a lot of detail on that. There's a whole bunch of people that can just do that right there. That's not what we're going to end up talking about so much. So lane occupancy time is extremely important to us. We have different costs for... Uh, vehicles that I drive versus commercial vehicles, day and nighttime costs could be different. Uh, a lot of long weekend closures you've seen in some states that are they're using this very, very nicely where you have alternate routes. A lot of public information associated with that as well. Close the facility is the best way to do it, if you can do it. You'll get the most production out of it, you get all geared up, you got multiple crews out there, etc. The contracting methods, anybody in construction engineering here, construction science? Okay, whole, whole, this is where you fit in there. How do you get this done? From, from, from a construction sequencing point of view, what method do you use to contract? We've got all kinds of options here that we can go through. It's not just about pavements, although we're going to talk about pavements a little bit more. It's about bridges as well. And um, bridges have got a head start on pavements. They've had an accelerated bridge uh, construction program, ABC, for a number of years now. And they can, they can build a bridge with tinker toys. Now, they're big tinker toys, but you can essentially do that today. And here's some bents that are being placed on, on some bridges. I think I had about 90 of these bents, made them off-site, brought them in, set them down, et cetera. Just really quick construction uh, with these particular things. Roll-in bridges. Amazing thing that, that happens. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to turn that off, but I do have some mother with health problems too, so that's not it. Good. So th this is something I have not seen personally, but it looks pretty impressive to me. Build a bridge off-site, roll it in. And it can be a little ways off-site or right next to the bridge. So really some neat concepts there. So what are the opportunities for us and others? In the materials area, uh, lots of things. Quality control, quality assurance, some really neat things that we could do there. We're not concerned in the asphalt field about traffic control, although we should do. We're not too concerned about the workforce, but these are major issues as well. The economic incentives have to be defined pretty accurately as well. And safety is, the, is a major, major part of this. And then we'll talk about equipment. So we're going to talk about balancing all these things to make a successful project. In the materials area, strength gain. If you're in the concrete area, um, we have to wait for the materials to gain strength. If you use cement stabilized, lime stabilized materials, port of cement concrete is a construction material, there's some time delays. What can we do to speed that up to get that done? In the asphalt area, we heat it up hot, mix it, place it hot, and then when it cools down, we can get on it right away. So there's, a, there's an inherent advantage associated with that in that particular case. Removal of existing materials and placing back, transporting, and placement of other materials how much money do we spend removing materials and putting materials back in there? Just a tremendous amount of time and money. We need better equipment to do that. We need to do it faster. Do we need to remove the materials? Can't we use the materials in place? There's a lot of technology around that that we should consider getting done here. And then we have production equipment to make, make all that happen. So the equipment area, I think, is a very, very lucrative area to take a look at. The problem is you can't just have one project, you've got to have a series of projects that will demand that equipment. You can get the equipment manufacturers excited about it to make a prototype. They see a market, they'll create the equipment. If they see no market, there ought to be no equipment. If you don't have accelerated construction, why develop the equipment and the thing just keeps going around and around. So we've got to break through that, make it happen. 
so the process control, quality control, wow. What a terrible process we have right now. So we go out there, we could build one of these, we, we can go out there and in one night lay 10,000 tons of hot mix. We had several crews out there, five crews, etc. And how do we know it's of quality? Well, we'll know sometime the next day. We don't have a lot of fast tools that we can do. And we may not even know the next day. Some of the tests we recall, Becky, well, three weeks later we'll know. And I'm telling you, it's okay. Oh, by the way, take it out. That's not going to work. Huge area that we have spent at least two major efforts in my career trying to make th breakthroughs in this area, and we haven't done it yet. So let's use electromagnetic waves to tell us the asphalt content. Oh, Sometimes there's water in there. So it, it just fouls things up. So there's some technology out there somewhere. I saw in a gold mine in Nevada, take a sample out of a quarry, bring it in a sack, put the sack on a conveyor belt, somebody inside the room dumped the sack out into the metal container and they didn't touch it again and they had this much silver in there and that much gold in there. Crushed it, sized it. <coughs> assayed it, et cetera. So we can do it. I know we can do it. So anyway, we've got to get on that. We've got to take care of that one. Traffic control, I don't want to say anything on that. Big area that needs improvement. Workforce, there's, here's the issues up here. We're going to have a lot of workforce issues on these projects that are accelerating. We may have crews living on the projects. They may be working 10-hour shifts maybe closer to 12-hour shifts. How many shifts can they work? What about their personal lives? How do you reward them for this? What's their capacity to do work? I know we, when we built a test track out in Nevada, I was out there every day from about 4.30 in the morning until about 11 at night, and, and I didn't know, I couldn't even think after about a week. I didn't know what was going on. It's just crazy. So that happens. What is the human capacity to associate with this thing? Economic incentives, again, Contractors will figure this out. They're not going to be in favor of it. Some cases, some of the larger ones will, the smaller ones won't. And they're, we're worried about bonding capacity, backlog of work. It, it really turns their, their whole world upside down a little bit when you stop thinking about this. Key items, uh, again, selection, planning and process. Contracting methods, got to be taken care of there. Design elements are extremely important. How do, what materials do you make out of these materials? How thick? The fewer materials you've got to haul out, the fewer materials you've got to haul in, better off you are. Uh, certainly stabilized materials of various kinds. How can we select a contractor that's capable of doing this? Because our bid-build process right now doesn't always do that. And then we have various construction considerations that we have to do here. I want to concentrate on this a little bit, public information. Critical, critical part of this whole thing in here. And right-of-way utilities and environmental and uh, railroad considerations are huge things that slow things up. Five methods that are best for accelerating construction in terms of contracting methods. Those were identified in the report. I just put them up there. Here's some of the design features that we have to go through. The bridge design, pavement design is what we concentrate certainly on here, but the other things are, are parts of these things. And I think we these are just some of the things that we need to think about that I will not, again, go into detail because of time this morning. Incentives and disincentives. Um, I worked for a contractor for 10 years, and we'd go out to a paving crew and say how things go yesterday, and their first response was we made a bonus of 3%, or we got dinged for 2%. The thing that that crew thought of first, almost all over the place, how well did I do for the company? How well, what measures do I have that tell me I'm doing a good job or not a very good job? And the incentives that we introduced into production of hot mix first um, number of years ago really have, in my opinion, have done a lot to get the quality of the material up. If we don't have incentives and disincentives associated with accelerated construction times, uh, I don't think this thing will move forward very quickly. And this last item down here, the construction community is some people don't want it involved in our planning, in our design, in our specification development. Don't want them involved. They have to be involved. They know the business better than we do. So these are really key things that have to be taken care of here. Incentives and disincentives, 
contracting community, and we need to have an accurate estimate of the project duration to get that time set so the incentive and disincentives can go off of that. Very key things involved in this. Involvement of the contractor is from, again, very early in the process, clear through the whole thing, making sure the equipment and workforce is, is available to do that. Work plan and work sequence, extremely important, having the right workforce, the space available. We can do things in public agency realm that will provide the workspace and have some incentives to get the right equipment out there. Again, this is a big area that we have to do there. It's not gonna go away. We gotta find a solution to this. Got to find it, and we fit in that in a major way. So let me just give five minutes, John, if I can, on philosophy for 50 years. Uh, we're still struggling with this. And um, how many have taken the pavement design, thickness pavement design class? Okay, so quite a few have been exposed to that. So you, you probably dealt with measuring elastic modulus or characterizing the material somewhere, E-star, master curves, whatever. Okay, just for your information, to my knowledge, that was started in the late 50s. Equipment wasn't as good. Science wasn't as good. Computers were not available. It was ugly to do, but it was being done and we still don't have it today that we're happy with. We'll never be happy with it, never. There's always a better mousetrap, but guess what? We, we displaced 400 million tons of hot mix last year worth about $30 billion, and we put it on pavements that were designed thickness. So what's going on out there all the time is not gonna stop and wait for us to say, oh, Becky's method's right, or John's method's right or my method's right. It's going to go on. So there's incent you need to have incentive to get the thing done. Get it done as best we can. Okay, so a few things. We've got to balance all those things. Some research considerations. The things that we do to characterize our asphalt binders and asphalt mixtures should always be done with the types of distress that we're trying to alleviate in mind. Are we trying to solve a rutting problem? A cracking problem? What kind of a problem are we trying to solve? It should be related to performance of some type of distress, in my opinion. Can the test that we're going to develop that we can use in pavement design be used for quality control and quality assurance purposes? It would be ideal if we could use it to design the thickness of our pavements, use the same test to design our optimum asphalt contents and our aggregate characteristics and gradations, and for quality control and quality assurance. We're not there. So rutting, raveling, bleeding, cracking, all these kinds of, of cracking that you see over here, aging, water sensitivity have to be brought in there as well. Those are really factors that are difficult to get a hold of. That's the durability part of the thing. So whatever we do, if you have a, your little favorite test, where does it fit in here? What problem is I having to solve? And does it relate to performance? We have been pushing and pulling on samples of asphalt mixtures for years. We've all developed different parameters to, to look at that push-pull kind of thing. We've got to even to dynamic loads, repeated loads, because that's what happens out there in the pavement. That's really good. And we've got all kinds of parameters. How well do they re relate to performance and these types of distress is still a little bit nebulous in our minds. So we have lab tests that we have performed. You see some over there on the right. By the way, those are the best because they're in our labs. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their own ideas, and that's fine. We have parameters that we develop from those tests. We need to relate them to performance, accelerated performance, wheel tracking tests like you have in Purdue, test tracks like we had out in Nevada and other places, test sections on real pavements around the state of Indiana, for example. And then you need large data sets you can't have small data sets. You've got to have large data sets to really get an idea of performance. And it's really difficult because there's so many variables in there. This is not rocket science. It's harder. It's more difficult because you have all those variables you have to deal with constructing, et cetera. QCQA. Can't emphasize this enough. Boy, do we need help here. We want to be able to have test that we can do rapidly, that we can use for input into pavement design, 
that we can use to, to design our asp optimum asphalt content gradations, aggregate characteristics. We want to be able to use those tests, in a, mix them in the laboratory, and compact them in the laboratory so we can get a parameter that we can use in pavement design and to estimate how much asphalt we want on that project. That's the first category up there. And then during production, we want to grab samples that we produce in the field and come back in the laboratory and run some tests on to get some answers back quickly for quality control or process control. And then we want to take samples out of the pavement, take core samples out of the pavement, which this line of information says, and relate those to performance somehow or as part of the assurance part of the program. Okay, so if you were going to characterize an asphalt mixture and relate it to performance, which of these three samples would you use? The lab mix, lab compacted, field mix, lab compacted, or the field mix, field compacted, if you're going to relate it to performance? Well, all three would be ideal, wouldn't it? If you do those three methods of preparing samples, you're going to get different results, and that's part of the problem. If you haven't figured that out, you will before you're through. Discussion. <laughs>